Okay, I want to say good evening to everyone. Again, thank you all for being a part of these Q and A's that we do every Saturday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. So we want to do a little house cleaning before we get started. Uh, just remind you all, these are our studies. There is no master teacher. We're all here to see what thus said the Lord. Uh, from the pages of inspiration, okay? Uh, again, there'll be no such thing as a dumb question. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to ask your question. Uh, there'll also be an opportunity for comments. Uh, if, there, if I say something or, or something is said, even if it's not from me, uh, that you don't agree with or you want some more clarity on, I want to encourage you to please ask your question, okay? Uh, we're here to hear the voice of God through the pages of inspiration. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to mute your mics if they're not muted. Uh, I want you to know these are being recorded. Uh, these sessions are being recorded. If you like a copy of these studies, uh, see Brother uh, Coffee. Uh, Brother Javier Frias, many of you know him, and they'll put a copy of these lessons, uh, studies into your hand, okay? But again, these are our studies, brothers and sisters, and we want to make sure that we conduct them in decency and in, in order, okay? And thank you, Brother Coffee. He's put his uh, email address in the uh, chat. And so, again, if you don't have his email address, uh, you can go ahead and put it, uh, get it from Brother Coffee. The information is in the chat. And uh, we'll do all that we can to make sure you have these studies in your hand. You can go back and review the things that are said, okay? All right, before we get started, we always want to open up in a word of prayer. Uh, and at this time, I'm going to ask if we could. Brother brother Claude, uh, you mind, brother? Uh, go ahead and get us started with an opening prayer as we deal with our Q&A tonight. Is there any request for prayer? If not, let us go to our Heavenly Father. Father, we come before you at this time. We come to give you thanks. We come to praise and honor your magnificent name, Father. We come to thank you for the blessings that you've showered upon us from our present, from our beginning to our present time, Father. We thank you. We thank you for your son that came and shared his precious blood that we might have right to the tree of life. Thank you, Father, for the teacher tonight that he has studied and read it himself to expand your words and that we may be ready to receive and understand and to hear it. Father, we ask that you would be with us, some of us in our twilight, some of us in our winter years, Father, with pains and aches, some of us on this Zoom program tonight are hurting, Father. We ask that you would ease their pain, that, that they'd be able to function properly and do the things that will be pleasing and serving your name, Father. Father, we, we ask that you would be with this country, the leaders of this country, that they would come to some conclusions on some of the matters that are pending, that they would remember that you are in charge. Father, we, we thank you for, for the blessings that pour out from you each day for our lives, Father. We know that you know each and every one of us. You know our problems. You know what we need before we even ask, Father. And we ask that you would continue to bless us in this manner. Father, we, we ask that you would, the following week would be a better week than this week was. If it be your will that we should survive, Father, we ask that you would continue to look over us. As you revealed our elders, our deacons, and our ministers. Father, they are your lighthouses, your guides, through your magnificent words. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Son. Father, we ask that you would continue to be with us, be with us on this Zoom with each and every one of us. This is our prayer to you, Father, and we thank you for hearing them. This is our prayer. In your son's name, we pray, oh man. Amen, amen. Okay, thank you, uh, Brother Claude. Appreciate appreciate the prayer. I want to start in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 16 and 17, very familiar passage of Scripture written by Paul uh, to Timothy. He says, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That means they're God-breathed, and it's profitable. What are they profitable for? For, for doctrine? For reproof? For correction? For instruction in righteousness? 
that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto, here we go, all good works. And so when Paul writes to young Timothy, he lets us know that the scriptures are God breathed. In other words, we understand that the Bible, the, the word of God was penned by the Holy Spirit through men, uh, inspiration, but ultimately the Holy Spirit uh, is the author of this book that you and I hold in our hands in our lap. It is inspired by God. And I mentioned this to us time and time again. Every book we have in the Bible, brothers and sisters, are not inspired because they're in the Bible. They're in the Bible because they are inspired. I want to make sure there's a difference. The, the Bible, the scriptures, the books, the 66 that we have in the book that we call the Bible is not inspired because they're in the Bible. They are in the Bible. They are preserved because they are inspired by God. And so we must remember the providence of God, that God through his providence has provided us with the full revelation that we need in order to leave here and to make heaven our eternal home. This same Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 to the saints in Corinth. I want you to go back there with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul wrote to the saints in Corinth. Uh, he wrote this information to this congregation of God's people that had a lot of problems when you do the study. Corinth was a, a Gentile people. Make sure you get that. The Corinthians were not Jews. The Corinthians were Gentiles, like you and I who are on this program. Gentile, other nations, not Jews. And the idea, they had a bunch of issues and a bunch of problems. And Paul writes to these particular congregations to address the various situations that they had. And in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to listen here what Paul says. And these things, brethren, have I in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos, he says, for your sakes. Now listen what he's telling them this, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. And so Paul lets these saints know that, hey, what you and I cannot ever do is to think of any human being above what was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Please get that in your spirit. And drop down to verse number 17, same chapter, because I want you to notice here what Paul said as he writes to the saints of grace. He said, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus or Timothy, the one we just read in 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 is the same Timothy Paul's making reference to here to the saints of Korea. He said to them, Timothy, he says, who is my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. Now, listen to what Paul says, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, I think that's an important scripture because Paul did not teach different doctrines to different churches. He taught the same doctrine, the same teaching to every church that belonged to Christ, to every people of God. This is why it's important that you and I understand we must speak the same language. We went back to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 10, and then we're going to answer the question. I just want to lay this foundation, brothers and sisters, because you and I have got to solidify in our mind that this book is right. The Bible is right. It is inspired by God. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 10, Paul tells these saints, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is he beseeching them? That you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. OK, and that's always been Paul's and it's always been God's uh, position that he wants us to be one. He wants us to speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among each other. OK, so I hope we've established that on, on tonight. OK, now now let's go to the first question that was posed to me during the week I want to deal with. And that is, can you address once again, the creation of Jesus from 1 Corinthians 8, 4, Revelation 3, 14, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. All right, so let's deal with this. Can you address again the creation of Jesus? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 8. Now, brother says we've got to understand something. There are three in the Godhead one. I'm going to say that again. There are three persons in the Godhead one. OK, now, when the Bible says first Corinthians eight, let's take it from from the, 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 the question that was asked in first Corinthians chapter eight. Let's start with verse one to help keep the context. Again, this is Paul writing to the saints in Corinth. He says, now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge, he says, puffs up, but charity edify it. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, now listen to this, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those 
things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Now, this is what Paul says. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Now, here's, that's where the question's coming from. We know that there is none other God but one. And so the context, brothers and sisters, always defines the meanings of words. So when Paul said there is no God but one, we have to understand the context he's talking about here is the Father. He's talking about there is just one Father. Because remember, Jesus is called God. The Holy Spirit is called God. Satan is called a God. You and I as human beings are called gods. I want to make sure we get that. So when he says there is but one God, he's making sure that you understand that there is one Father. Okay? Now, now let, me, let me prove it. I'm going to prove this from the same book of the Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Understand this, brothers and sisters. Jesus has a God. I'm going to say that again. Jesus has a God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. Now, this is the same book that Paul writes to the saints in Corinth. He said, but I would have you know that the head, when he wrote this, is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the head of every man is Christ. And I think everybody on here should agree with that, that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. When we talk about authority, we understand God created Adam, but then he created Eve. The head of the woman is the man. Now, listen to what he goes on to say. And, uh, and he says, and the head of Christ is God. Y'all see that? The head of Christ is God. Jesus, before he ever came to this world, was a son of God. He was the son of God. In heaven, there's three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. I'm going to get to the creation part in just a minute, but I want to make sure we establish this. That even before Jesus came to this world, he was the son of God. That's what John 3, 16, really John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, okay? And the word, verse 14, became flesh, verse 14 of John 1, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. But before Jesus ever came to this world, he was the son of God, and he never claimed to be his father. Go to John 17 now, John 17, real quickly, John 17. It's important that we understand this, brothers and sisters. I'm going to show you how he was created. John 17. John 17. And Jesus wasn't just the son of God when he came through the womb of Mary. I'm going to say that again. God gave his son. That's what the scripture said. His son became or was made flesh. I'm going to show you in a minute. Just read. Now, listen to what Jesus says in his earthly. We're going to read the words of Jesus in John 17. This is his prayer. These words spake Jesus, John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh, who's given Jesus power over his father did? That he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Who gave people to Jesus? The father did. And this is life eternal, that they may they might know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Y'all see that? Listen to verse four. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was before the world was created jesus was in existence with his father and he was there with the spirit this is why brother it's called the godhead divinity the godhead jesus has always had a god now let me show you something here now go if you'd be so kind with me go to the book of go to the book of uh of hebrews make sure go to the book of hebrews Hebrews chapter number, chapter one, Hebrews chapter one, Hebrews, and the chapter I want us to look at is chapter number, number one. 
Now listen what the, I'm going to show you now. Jesus was created by his father. Hebrews chapter one. This is what the Hebrew, and I'm opening up for questions. Hebrews chapter one. Now look with me in verse number four. Being made. Now this is the, the Hebrew writer is, is showing us. Matter of fact, let's start with verse one. I want to start with verse one because this is how God speaks to us today through his son. And what the son has given us to say through the Holy Spirit of men that pen this book, you and I hold in our hand, our laps and our apps. God, who at sundry times, this is what God used to do. And in divers manners, spake in time past under the fathers by the past. That's what he did in times past. But in these last days, he has spoken to us how? By his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So the father made the world through Jesus. Please get that. Now, this is what he's going to describe Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, in other words, Jesus is the brightness of the glory of his Father, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, know what Jesus did, purged our sins, and notice where Jesus is now. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Right now, Jesus is back where he was before this world was created, next to majesty. Now, look at verse 4. Being made so much better than the angel. Now, stop right there. This Just the first part of this verse lets you know that Jesus was made better than the angel. This is not talking about when he came to this world. There in the seven days of creation, the six days of creation, you don't find a verse where Moses writes where the angels were created in the six days of creation of this world. Jesus was before this world, just like the angels were before this world. But how did Jesus and the angels come into existence? Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels. He was made just like the angels were made, a living spirit. We'll say that again. Jesus was made a living spirit. Who made him? The Father did. Now listen to this. Being made so much by the angels, has he obtained by inheritance a, a more excellent name than they? For under which of the angels said he at any time? When God created the angels, he never said this to the angels. You are my son. This day have I begotten you. See, the word begotten means birth, brought you forth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, brought forth, his only begotten son. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. God the Father never said that to the angels. He never made that declaration to the angels. But when he made his son, that's what he said. Look at verse 6. And again, when he bring it in the first, now notice this. He brings in the first begotten into the world. See, he was already the first begotten. Jesus was created before the angels. He is the first begotten of God. He is the first of the Father's creation. Jesus was in the process of the creation of the angels. Colossians teaches us that. Everything in heaven and earth was made for him and by him. Do you all understand that? That's what he's teaching us here. He said, and let all the angels of God, that's what the angels had to do, worship him. And of the angels, he said, now listen to what he said to the angels, verse 7, who make it his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the son, he said, your throne. Now, this is what the father said to the son. Your throne, O God, who calls Jesus God. Listen, but he, under the son, he said, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Okay, and so this verse will prove and solidify that Jesus was made or Jesus was created. Go to Revelation 3. One more scripture, and I'm opening it up. Revelation 3. Revelation 3, 14. Jesus, out of his own mouth, will tell the saints in Laodicea that he was created by his father. That doesn't make him less God, but he never claimed to be his father. Please understand that. Just because he was created don't mean he's not God, but he's not the father. Please understand, there are some things that Jesus do not know. He doesn't know when he's going to return. He says, only my father in heaven knows. He's not trying to trick himself. Jesus is not lying to himself and say, I don't know the day or the hour where I'm going to come back, but my father only. Jesus is not tricking himself in the garden of Gethsemane when he's on earth saying, Father, if there's any other possible way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. But I know that he's not tricking himself. He's talking to his father. 
Father, if there's any other way than me going to this cross to die for the sins of the world, then let me take that avenue. Yeah. But if there's not, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so he's praying to his father. Now look in Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things said the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. These are references that Jesus is making about himself. He is the beginning of the creation of his father. That's what he's teaching us. And it does not make him less God. He is the image of his father. This is why in John 14, he tells him, when you see the father, you've seen me. You don't see the father. You see the image of his father, the character of his father. But you don't see the father. All right, any questions? Any questions? Did that answer that question? Or did somebody need some more clarity on that? On, on uh, addressing the creation of Jesus? Go ahead, Brother Jerry. Okay, okay, my question is, like how Jesus, how Melchizedek is a type of Jesus, does he describe as having a uh, a beginning and a, and a uh, and an ending. How can you explain that? Did Jesus ever have the beginning? Your your mic is out. Oh, I'm sorry. Go to Hebrews seven. Thank you, brother. Go to Hebrews seven. We'll explain that. Kills it there. Beginning and see it, it, that that's a great question. Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. So if he's the beginning, he's the beginning of what? The, he's the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. See, you can't, you and I can't say, oh, he's the Alpha and Omega, that he's the beginning of his father. My goodness. He is the beginning. He is the, he is the beginning of everything except his father. Please understand that. I'm going I'm to make sure we get that. Jesus is the beginning of everything God the Father created except his father. He is the Alpha and Omega. So when the Bible talks about uh, Melchizedek in Hebrews 7, we'll go there, Hebrews 7. Uh, and if I'm talking fast, y'all bear with me because I, I, I want to make sure people, we get this, brothers and sisters. Melchizedek, here's what's so crazy. Come on, you know, people, I, I don't understand this. Melchizedek, brothers and sisters and friends, was a human being. We got to get that first in our spirit. Eve, in Genesis 3.20, is called the mother of all living. This is why we have foolish doctrines and teachings in the world that there was somebody before, before, uh, before Adam and Eve on earth. Well, then this Bible is a, a, a false book, and it is not inspired by God. Because Genesis 3.20 is very clear that Eve is the mother of all living. There was only two people that were created in the flesh, Adam and Eve. Everybody else came from a woman. Please understand it. So if we believe Melchizedek was a high priest, if we believe he was an individual, that means he had a mama. He had an earthly mother. You, got, you can't believe the, uh, the, the, the Bible and believe that Melchizedek just popped out of the air somewhere. It, it's ridiculous. So listen what he's saying here. In verse number one of Hebrews 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So what the Hebrew writer did go, all, he went all the way back. I'm not going to do a history study on him tonight. That's not my goal tonight. Genesis 14, he goes all the way back to Genesis 14, and he, he shows us what Abraham did uh, with Melchizedek back in Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Now listen to this. He says, without father, verse 3, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but it is, but made like unto the Son of God, abiding a priest continually. The author here, the Hebrew writer, is dealing with how Melchizedek became a priest because God just appointed him. It had nothing to do with genealogy. Had nothing to do with who Melchizedek's mama was, who his daddy was, but God appointed him a high priest, just like the father appointed Jesus as a high priest, and it has nothing to do with genealogy. Y'all see that? So you got to understand it has nothing to do with law. Get this. Melchizedek is called a high priest 
before the law of Moses was even given. Do y'all see that? Before the law of Moses was even given, God appointed him a high priest showing that God appointed Jesus, who is now a high priest, and it has nothing to do with the law of Moses. So how can Jesus be a priest? How can Jesus today, because physically he was born from the tribe of Judah, and you can't be a priest from the tribe of Judah. So what is the Hebrew writer trying to show us? What is he teaching us? He's teaching us that the law had to change. Go to Hebrew, drop down to verse 14, same chapter. See, people say, well, yeah, if, if you and I believe Jesus is a high priest today, it has to mean the law changed. Otherwise, Jesus sinning. If we're still under the law of Moses for righteousness, because he could not be a priest because he's from the wrong tribe. But the reason he can be our high priest today is because the law changed. Look at verse 11, Hebrews 7, 11. If therefore per per perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood, listen to this, being changed, there is made a necessity, a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. What are you saying, Hebrew writer? He's saying that to be a, a priest, to be able to forgive sins, a high priest, you had to be from uh, uh, the right tribe, the tribe of Judah. I mean, forgive me, the tribe of Levi, but Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. So if Jesus has the power, you know, to go before God and to forgive sins and to make sacrifices for sins, it must mean that the law changed. So he says in verse 14, for it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He's letting you know that. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. You see that? So when the Bible calls Jesus the Alpha and Omega, he is. He is the beginning of everything in this life, and he's going to be the end. Because you know what? He's going to have the final say so. He is the beginning and the end. Now go to 1 Corinthians 15, just real quickly. I'm going to prove to you right now as we speak, 1 Corinthians 15. That everything, remember, Jesus said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Who gave it to him? The Father did. Now, everything is under Jesus' feet. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, except his Father. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus never came to override his Father, to tell his Father what to do. He never said, I'm greater than my Father. He understood that he came to do his Father's will. Now, look at what, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's start with verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that they are Christ at his coming. So Jesus is going to come back one day. Now look what he says. Then cometh the end, when he, talking about Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and power. Y'all see that? So whenever the Father sends Jesus back, Jesus is going to judge everybody. Everybody. It's every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will confess that, Jesus, you are Lord. Everybody's going to say that. Every Muslim, every Buddhist, every atheist. Now, listen to what he says. For, G for he, verse 25, Paul is explaining, for he, talking about Jesus, must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Are people still dying today? Absolutely. Guess what that means? Jesus is still reigning today. If people are still dying, they are. That means Jesus is still reigning because death is an enemy. Now look what he says. For he, talking about the father now, had put all things under his feet. The Father put everything on the Jesus feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest or it's understood that he is accepted. Y'all see that? The Father put everything on the Jesus feet except himself. Everything is under Jesus feet except the Father, which did put all things under him. 
Jesus has never claimed to be greater than his father. So when you talk about Alpha and Omega, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's the beginning of God's creation. And again, he will have the final say, say the last word uh, when this world as we know it is over. Any other question? Brother Jared, did that answer your question? Okay, God bless you, brother. It did, it did. God bless you, my brother. Anybody have any other question? Any other about, uh, go ahead, uh, Brother Coffee. Uh, yes, a uh, great lesson, Brother Henry. Um, when you mentioned earlier in the study um, that Jesus um, was a living spirit, it all makes sense because when we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 27, Jesus, when God was speaking to him, he could not have had his flesh, earthly body, when that was spoken. So, you know, I think I was, when I think I was talking to Brother um, Green this afternoon, and and sometimes we try to make life different than when we look at it from a spiritual perspective, to the extent any person, any child has to have a father. I, I don't understand why then it has to be so mind boggling for, for the scriptures that teach us that the father has a son. Why call him a son? You can't, you can't call me a son if I don't have a father. So in other words, well, who is God's father? See, this, this logic gets real twisted and crazy if you just don't allow the simplicity of the scriptures teach you. And here's the reality. And I've said this before. I did not, I never heard of this subject matter prior to me being baptized into Christ. Six and a half years later, I'm learning it. But it makes sense when you're right, when, when the scriptures are rightly divided. Amen. I can study it. Amen. It's not so much you just believe, and some of these brothers get carried away. You just believe it because the brother teaching it. We just going to just... Okay, whatever he says goes. No, that's not the way that goes. Amen, preacher. So I, I just thank you for the, for the teaching tonight because I just wanted to get back out there again. That yeah, uh, amen. And let's let's, 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 let's let's let Paul prove this again. Y'all still in First Corinthians fifteen? Look at verse number 44, 45. Listen to this. He's going to say the same thing again. The the problem people are going to have is with God. First Corinthians fifteen. Now listen at verse number forty five. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Let me stop right there. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Do y'all see that? Listen to this. And then he says, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Y'all see that? Both were made. Both were made. Jesus is called, Jesus, y'all know Jesus is called Adam, right? Jesus is called the second man, Adam. And the scriptures is letting us know that both of them were made. The second man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. The last Adam, that's Jesus. You remember he called the Alpha and Omega. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Adam was made, and that's when he. That's why Genesis one he says, "I'm let's make man and our likeness and our image." That's the Father talking. The Father is talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us, us who the Godhead, let us make man in our likeness, and our image. Well, how was that done? I'm the Father. I made you. Y'all understand that? I made you. That's how it's. That's how it's done. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna make man like the Godhead in that image, in that likeness. And so the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam, which is Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Who made him? The Father did. Brother Kennedy. Ah, uh, yes. Um can can this fellowship be used outside of, or let me rephrase that. Is the only time this fellowship or uh, withdrawing fellowship is used, is it when a person is living in sin? Can we use that um, for any other reason um, when we're withdrawing fellowship from a brother? No, you, I mean, the only reason to ever disfellowship from a brother or sister is because they refuse to repent uh, of sins that they're practicing. And it's it, and that's just a, a it's a discipline 
that God gives the church for the benefit of the person we love so. You know, uh, yeah, all discipline, brother, the word discipline, disciple. It's what you do to help disciple an individual uh, to get in a right relationship with God. The only time you withdraw yourself, you know, from an individual, I guess you, I'm assuming you're talking about from the, the, the church or, you know, or you withdraw yourself from somebody, you know, that's practicing that refuse to repent. You, you can withdraw from them. I hope, I, I guess I, I don't. So can, can the elders, uh, can the elders agree to withdraw uh, a fellowship from a member just because they uh, disobeyed, I guess, what they feel is a direct no. They said, okay. Yeah, see, we don't we don't get to define what sin is. And I can't get my throw my feelings into the hat or or a member do something that I deem they should not have done and I just decide as a group we're going to disfellowship. And just because they may do it, you may have some evil leaders, but just because they do it, I'm not doing it. Uh, amen. I mean, again, you're going to stand before God, brothers and sisters, as an individual. There's a lot of congregation or church where you got leaders who are teaching false doctrine, who are not doing the right thing. But I'm not going to be judged as the Goose Creek Church of Christ. And so even among wicked leaders and evil men, you and I still got to do the right thing. That's just it. Stand up. Uh, call the individual. So you can talk to them. I disagree with what they've done. And you can be the one. Stand up and stand with uh, the people that they're withdrawing from. But you, you need to be a voice and let people know where you stand. Yeah, but for a congregation just to stand up and say, we're going to withdraw because I don't like what so-and-so did. Well, what did they do? Was it sin? And they won't repent. Well, no, you, we can't. You, you might withdraw from them, but you can't stand up and say, we as a congregation going to withdraw from them. I mean, that's just, you, they will have to answer to God for that, brother. Yeah, answer to God. for. I hope that answered the question. And again, you, what we do, brother, says we judge cases. We're priests. And our job is to judge cases when they come up. That's what we do. We judge cases. Every case is different. So once we get all the facts and the details, might need to withdraw from the leadership that's trying to withdraw from somebody who ain't practicing sin. They might need to be more to withdraw from, you know, because we always want to be on God's side. Always want to be on God's side, and we can defend uh, God's side with God's word. Okay, yeah. So that's ridiculous. Somebody's got to stand up and let the individuals know that hey, I'm, I'm not withdrawing from you because you, know, you didn't do anything wrong. And, and and I'm not gonna withdraw from you. I'm gonna love you, and we're gonna and 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 I'm gonna treat you like that. Okay, that's that's just it. I hope that answered the question. Uh, any other question? Any other question? Yes, Sister Hernandez. Can you please go back on First Corinthians 15 and verse 46 a little bit? Okay. It says, and so it is written. Let's go back up to verse 44. It is sown a natural body. And Paul is dealing with the resurrection and how our bodies, how we're going to be resurrected, how there were some that didn't believe there was a resurrection. And they were trying to explain, well, how will the body be resurrected? And so he explains the different types of bodies that God has prepared for life for other beings. You know, he, he mentioned their celestial bodies in verse 40, terrestrial bodies. Uh, and how the body's different. You know, our bodies are not designed uh, to, to live on the water without some type of apparatus. You know, God developed a fish's body, a different type of body for that tip, different type of environment. And so just like there's going to be a different environment in heaven, these bodies that you and I are in will not be able to sustain heaven. That's why he's going to say flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, and that's the idea. And so God is going to prepare a different body and the body is going to be spiritual. And so what he's using is, is he's going back to creation, how he created the father and how he created angels, spirits that were able to dwell, get this, in the presence of God. See, we have to have a different body to be able to dwell in the presence of God whenever, whenever you and I leave here. So he says in verse 44, it's sown a natural body, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. Verse 44, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. First Corinthians 15, 44. And then he, then he says, and so it is written. So he goes now, he goes all the way back to Genesis chapter two. And so it is written. Well, written where? Why would Paul bring up and so it is written? Well, he's going to take their mind back to the scriptures. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Adam was. Adam was made a living soul, flesh and blood on this earth. The last Adam, that's Jesus, 
was made a quickening spirit. Again, I'm just showing you that both were made by the Father. The Father can make an earthly body. Matter of fact, he prepared a body for Jesus. The Lord prepared that body that you and I read about that was hung on the cross. How did Who made the body? Who prepared the body? The Father did. The Father prepared that body for Jesus to become a man, but the Bible also shows he was made a quickening spirit first. So Jesus was made a quickening spirit before the body was ever made, and Jesus was in the presence of his Father. But he was made, brothers and sisters, he was created by his Father. That's ridiculous. I mean, to deny father and son is so ridiculous. People say, well, brother, see, well, 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 can't you be a father and can't you be a son? And that's what you argue. Aren't you a father? And they argue this to say they're all one, that Jesus, the father, son, and the Holy Spirit. Aren't you a father and aren't you a son, brother? Seems and I say, yeah, but I'm not my own father and I'm not my own son. Do you all understand that? I can't be my own father. I can't be my own son. So Jesus had a father. He is Jehovah. And if Jehovah had to be created, then he ain't Jehovah. Do y'all understand that? Jehovah can't be made. People are scratching their head. Well, how, where did the father come from? You'll jump out the 10th floor of a window trying to figure out where Jehovah came from. You lost your mind. He's God. He wasn't created. He is the father, Jehovah, capital L-O-R-D. And we've got to understand that nobody made Jehovah. Nobody made him. That's why Jesus said, He's greater than me. He's greater than I am. He's given me all power and all authority. He's my father. I love him because he created me. Any other questions? Did that answer your question, sister? Yes, my dear brother. Sure. Okay. And y'all don't take my lifting my voice and yelling as I'm angry and mad. It's just that's just who I, I am. I'll work on that. But hey, I'm hoping I'm, I'm, I'm upset at the devil with this foolishness. That's what I'm upset at. Uh go ahead. Somebody has a brother Byers. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, brother Henry, I got a question. Sure. Because you and I have talked about this a few times. So was Jesus ever considered the father at any time? Never. Never. Okay. Never. So let's turn over to Isaiah. Okay. Chapter nine. Mm hmm. And verse six. Okay. So, and here's, here's I'm going to read the verse and then I'm going to ask the question. So, okay. in verse six, it says, For uh, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God the everlasting father. So my question is, what is, this is talking about Jesus. What is, Amen. Jesus, what is Jesus the father of? Okay, God, good, God bless you. Now, first of all, now when he's describing the father, he's describing him, Jesus, as you said, this is the image of Jesus. Now, I'm gonna show you John 14 here in just a minute, but I wanna make sure we stay here because I'm gonna show you John 14. Remember brothers and sisters, Jesus is the image of, of his father. No one has seen the father. Please understand this. Nobody can see the father except the son. No one has seen him in his full glory except his son. Jesus is called the image. Yeah, I want you to get this. The image of his father. So when you see him, you're seeing the, the character, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. That, that, that's, that's, that's the character of God. So when you saw the character of Jesus, remember, Jesus came to declare unto us the Father. Before I get to John 14, go to John 1. We'll get to John 14. Go to John 1. He's not saying that he is the Father. He's saying, just like you and I, if you're a Christian, we're supposed to represent the image of, of Christ. I'm going to make sure we get that. I'm not Christ. But when people hear me and see me and see how we act, see how we li live, see how we love, see how we forgive, they should see the image of Christ. But I'm not Christ. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Does he mean uh, literally? I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's not literal. He wasn't on the cross. But he's saying my life is about him. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
And so he's using figurative language here. Go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Go to John 1. This is what John is explaining. John 1 is a very powerful gospel. Thank God for, for John, the apostle of love, for the Holy Spirit allowing him to write this because the whole book, the whole book of John is to prove that he's the son of God. That is what this whole book is written for, to prove that he is the son of God. Now look in John 1, and uh, let's just look at verse uh, I, I know we already studied this. Let's start with verse one. In the beginning was the word, words with God, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Y'all see that? He was with God. He was with his father. All things were made by him. Do y'all see that? Everything was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Talking about Jesus. In him was life and the light was the light of men and the light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended in night. And then he started talking about John the Baptist. I'm going to skip down. He's going to talk about John, who talked about the true light. Now look in verse number, uh, verse number, uh, verse number twelve. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now remember, if you're on here, you and I are called sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on his name, which was born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word made flesh dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, y'all see what he says about Jesus. He was made flesh. And John said, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is before, before me, for he was before me. Now, I want you to think about what John just said. Remember, John is physically older than Jesus. I want to make sure we stop and get what's going on here. John is physically older. He is six months older than Jesus. They are cousins. But John just made the statement that Jesus is older than him. Now, how is that? How is that possible? Spiritually. Spiritually, because John is definitely physically older. Spiritually. Now, listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. For the law was given by Moses, verse number 17. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 18. No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he had, get this, declared him. Now notice what, he, what, what has Jesus shown us? What has Jesus declared to us? Isaiah 9, 6. That, 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 that he has a, the father, mighty, he's the image, the mighty God. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's loving. He's forgiving. He's powerful. He can forgive sins. Where does that authority come from? The father. Now go to John 14. Go to John 14. This is, see, this was, this was Philip's problem. Well, you know, you say you're the son of God, show us the father. That, that was their problem. That was their dilemma. You're the son of God, then show us the father. Now look at John chapter 14. Look with me in verse number. Y'all know one to, let's read it. It is being recorded. Verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. Let's stop right there. You believe in God. Well, I thought he is God. Yeah, but this God, he's talking about the father. If you believe in the father, believe in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Now listen, Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming unto the father. He's not talking about himself. No man coming unto the father, but by me. Now listen to what he says in verse seven. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. Now, how is that? How is that? Because he came to show the attributes, the characteristics of his father. He came to do his father's will. You saw Jesus, wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, Prince of Peace. All characteristics of his father. He says, and from henceforth you know him, and have seen him. Remember, brothers and sisters, he's spirit. God is a spirit. He's a spirit. That's what he is. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so when you saw the spirit, the nature of Jesus, the attributes of Jesus, you saw the character or the image of his father spiritually. He never claimed to be his father. 
And so uh, the idea behind Isaiah 9 in, in verse number 6 is just that. Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy about himself in Isaiah 9, 6. I hope that helped. Any other question? Any other question? All righty, saints. Uh, man, it was, it's been a long time. Yeah. I know Brother Green had a thought. But Brother Green, did you want to ask your question? I kind of forgot where you were with I don't know if you want to ask that tonight or you want to hold off on it. It's really up to you all. Anybody have any other questions? You have any concerns? Yeah, yeah Brother Stevenson, we can hold it to next week. Okay, my brother. All right. No problem at all. Unless anybody else got anything, I'm good. No Bible questions. Okay, go ahead, uh, Sister Amber. Um, yes, I want to ask um, if you have any scripture or get some clarity on if generational curses exist in families. Generational curses, do they exist? You know, Exodus 18, I mean, forgive me, Ezekiel 18, and there's no, there's no such thing as a generational curse. You know, what you have to understand is we're all individuals. You know, you talk about generation. You know, what God has done through his son, he has, and, and, and a new covenant, he has made it now to where God has made it. When I say he, the father has made it through his son where God's law can be put in every individual's heart. You know, even when there were talking about generational curses, everybody, when those curses were even pronounced under the Old Testament, didn't have to experience the curse if they did was right. Remember, one of the groups of people that was to be destroyed were the uh, the Hittites. I'll just, I'm just going in my head through many uh, different types of people that the law said should have been destroyed. Uh, Uriah was a Hittite, but he was a very faithful man uh, to David. Now, even though the generation of the Hittites were one of the generations that was living in the land of Canaan that should have been destroyed. So what I want us to understand is when God cursed a generation, he was dealing with just the nation itself, but the people could still be, if you were of that nation, be brought out of it and saved. Rahab is another great example. You know, she's in Jericho. God's going to destroy those, those people in, in Jericho. But because of her belief in the true and the living God, God saves her and spares her. So there's no such thing as, as you know, talking about a, a generational curse that because you're from a certain lineage or your mama or your daddy and them are cursed, that, that that means you, there's just no hope for you. That's never been the God we serve. God has always given individuals a right to make wise decisions, regardless of what your parents or grandparents, what they used to believe. That's why we have to understand everybody's going to be judged uh, for themselves, what they've done, and not for what somebody else done. You and I are not sinners because of Adam's sin. You might say, well, that's a generational curse. No. If you, go, if you and I die lost because of our own sin. I'm not going to hell because I ate from a tree of the of the knowledge of good and evil. That ain't why anybody on here will be in hell, because you ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You will be in hell because of your own sin. And the soul that sin is the soul that dies. Ezekiel 18, and let's... Uh, Let's start with verse number, let's, let's, let's look at verse 18. Uh, as for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. So in other words, he's showing everybody's responsible for their own faith and their own action. Yet you say, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son had done that which is lawful and right, and had kept all my statutes and had done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinned, it, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be on him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he had committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Y'all see that? And so that's what makes God a just God. He's a fair God. He's a righteous God. God's not going to hold you and I ac accountable for the sins of, of what our great, great, great grandparents did or anybody for that matter. OK, so I hope that helped. Um, yes, it was more of the same. I know that we don't 
carry everybody's responsible for their own decision when you go before god we're going to answer for the choices we made and everything but when you see like with children and i know this is said in families life and and and, and mine too according to certain things my children um the especially the oldest one i'm having some behavior issues and it's just that every man his father his grandfather is the same actions and stuff and i gotta tell him but he's responsible if he wants to continue yeah you can see the same behavior in each one that they was just like that the grandpa was just like that you know and they're saying that's where you get it from but he's still responsible if he chooses to continue on the path of stars um not being respectful uh you know not obeying the rules that set before him so just being informed to say I know that general case is passed. They they're thinking it's passed. Well, they're denominational. It's passed down. That is, this is in family, you know. Um, but yeah, I I know now in the Church of Christ being taught correctly that we don't. Everybody's responsible for their Amen. own decisions and their own choices they're making. Amen. Ecclesiastes seven twenty nine. Lo, um, God has made man upright, but he sought out many inventions. So you know that, and, and again, you know. Um, Proverb proverbial writer said, you know, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but that rod of correction will draw it far away from them. I'm going to tell you that, you know, if they don't, then, you know, you just hand them over, you know, you do all that you can and they want to get grown and want to be rebellious. You just hand them over uh, to the Lord, you know, but once you done, remember God knows all the souls. Again, for you and I to try to determine, talking about that's a generational gap, and he's gonna be just like his mama, he just like it. That's foolishness. Make sure we get that. That is foolishness. And uh, what we do is we we teach what God said, teach that God love them. You can change. You don't have to be like your parents if your parents weren't right. Uh, with God and how they lived and how they acted. But if they choose to go down that road, God already knows that too. And you just hand them over. But you and I can't say, oh, you know, that's just what who they are. And that's just how they're going to be. And they can't change. And we got some saints that have that mentality that people can't change. And that's just how who they're going to be. They've been, their parents been like that all their life. And they'll never change. And God can't change them. And God help us if we're, if we're teaching our children that. And that's kind of foolish. It ought not be spewed out of our mouth. It ought not be spewed out of our mouth. All right. Any other question? Any other Bible question, comment or thought? All right, saints, thank you all so much for being a part of these studies, these Q&As. And uh, Lord's will, I will meet on Monday on the Zoom, on Brother Green's Zoom page. We're in Proverbs uh, chapter number six, okay? Proverbs six. It's been great studies if you haven't been a part of those. Are there any prayer requests before we close out? Any prayer requests by anybody? Okay, if not, Brother Bob. Uh, yes, like just, oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Y'all keep me in prayer that... Uh, um, tomorrow, following this, um, the meeting at the congregation that uh, that the Holy Spirit um, uses me to say the right things and and pray that uh, you know some change come from it. Just keep me in prayer. Sure will, brother Kennedy. God, God's with you, my brother. You know, just go in there with you know with with your heart set on on doing the right thing, saying the right thing, and go in there, brother, with the mindset of bringing people together. Okay, that's all you can do, and then let the chips fall where they may, brother. These guys gotta know how to show compassion and mercy, brother. Because I'm telling you, if we don't know how to show compassion and mercy, we're not gonna get it from God. And I'm I'm afraid we just got too much. Too much uh, foolishness going on in the church, brothers. We, a lot of doctrine, a lot of knowledge, but not enough love. And that's that's our problem. And that's what Paul is saying. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It edifies. And these guys are so bent on wanting to be right and do right. They want to be right, even if it's at the stake of people losing their soul or running away from the church because you're right. on where's the compassion at? Where's the mercy? Where's the forgiveness? You know, I'm telling you, brother, so go in there with the right spirit, brother, and just let the chips fall where they may. God be with you. We'll pray for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, Brother Bowers, you mind giving us a closing prayer, please? Sure. Let us all pray. To the great God of heaven, we come before your throne of mercy and grace. And Father, we thank you for all things. We thank you for what you are to us. And we thank you, Father, for uh, blessing us daily. We thank you, Father, for Brother Stevens. We thank you, Father, for his boldness and his tenacity. But we also uh, thank you, Father, for the wisdom you have given him. And we thank you, Father, that he is able uh, to preach your word, to deliver your word, to deliver your message, to equip the saints uh, for the edification of the body. So, uh, Lord, we ask that you continue to bless him and his family. We ask you to continue to bless him in his ministry. And Father, we ask that uh, he will be able to continue uh, doing this teaching and to, to guide your saints. 
Father, we come on behalf of uh, Brother Gilberto. Uh, Father, you know the things that are occurring uh, at, at the congregation uh, at Long Creek. And Father, we know that we stand on your word. Your word is true. And we ask, Father, that uh, the elders and uh, the congregation can come together peacefully and to uh, discuss matters and issues uh, concerning the church. But Father, let uh, the minds uh, be wise and, and, and use proper judgment uh, as they discuss the issues. And Father, we know that uh, problems exist in every congregation. And Father, we just ask that you um, hold the leaders and the elders and the evangelists. Father, we just ask them uh, that they use um, judgment, wise judgment, your counsel, O oh Lord, to deal with each and every issue. Father, you gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we just ask, O oh Lord, that uh, your word be true and that we will let your word guide us. Father, there are those who need prayer on this uh, forum that may not have made their request known. Father, we just ask that you bless them, uh, that you send your full force of mercy upon them, and that you will be able to give them the things that they stand in need of and help them guide uh, through this daily life. And Father, we just ask that you continue to bless us and keep us. And now, O oh Lord, as we depart uh, from this session, we just ask that you keep us until we meet again on this form. Uh, bless us, uh, Father, and, and keep us safe. We ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, Brother Power. Wonderful Amen. prayer, my brother. God bless you. Amen. Praying for you, Brother Gilberto. Stay strong, my brother. God's with you, mother. All right, Saint. Love y'all the love of God. And you all have a good night. Good, good night. night. Good night. Good night.